Okay. All right, I'll get started. I just have a few slides um, to give some basic uh, history and the, the status of Rwanda today. So here's the map of Rwanda. Um, for those of us in the United States, many of us probably have heard of, you know, the, the, the genocide in particular. And so it seems like Rwanda should be this huge place. Um, and the map that was on that first slide kind of makes it look like a huge place. Um, some basic facts, the capital is Kigali. Its president is Paul Kagame. Um, he is the head of state or the chief of state. The prime minister or head of government is Edvard, um, I'm gonna kill it, uh, Ngurenti. Ngurenti, is that close, Dorian? No, Ngurenti. Oh, not even close. <laughs> All right, Ngurenti. All right, it's 12.7 million people. Um, the dominant groups are Hutu and Tutsi with a smaller minority of um, Twa, or the Tua, Twa, yeah. um, forest um, people, people live in forests. The official language there is of Bantu vernacular. The other official languages, though, are French, English, and Swahili, or Kishwali, Kishwahili, sorry, um, which is often used in the commercial centers. The um, country is largely Christian with about a little over 49% Protestant, 44% Catholic, 2% Muslim, and the rest either not having any religion or um, you know, being other religion. It's a largely agrarian state. It's only about 17.4% urban as of 2020. Um, oops, sorry. Um, but Rwanda is an absolutely beautiful country. Um, the climate is quite temperate, even in the mountains. It's got two rainy seasons, um, February, to, February to April, November to January. Because of its mountains and, and mountainous regions, it's called the land of a thousand hills. And I would strongly encourage you to look at, you know, just Google visit Rwanda. Um, I think we might be able to go there. No, we won't because I, I failed to check it before I opened my slides. But um, Tourism in Rwanda, it's an absolutely gorgeous country. It is on my short list of places to visit. So um, I've mentioned that to Dorian and Arno as well, um, that sometime when they go home, they need to invite some of us to their homes. <laughs> um, the economy of Rwanda. And again, this is the map that really shows you that yeah. Rwanda plays an outsized role um, in its neighborhood. Rwanda is this tiny little green here with the capital Kigali but it has a lot of influence over its neighbors. Um, it has terrific agricultural products that it exports. Um, it also exports minerals and um, some agro processing services. Things that it really makes money from are tourism, the minerals and coffee and tea. And I can attest that at least Rwandan coffee, I haven't had any Rwandan tea, but Rwandan coffee is outstanding. Um, the challenge is, that food production in Rwanda does not necessarily keep up with demand in Rwanda. So they do import food as well as sell food. Their primary export partners are UAE and Kenya, Switzerland, the Democratic Republic of Congo, the United States, and Singapore um, in order of the amount of trade they do with us. Keep UAE in mind. We're gonna mention that when we get to Paul Rusesabagian in a minute. Um, a very brief look at Rwanda's history. It is, um, again, an oversized power. It's a small country by territory, but has a great deal of, of weight in its region, in the African Great Lakes region. Um, it was dominated by the Tutsi monarchs from the mid 18th century. But um, back in um, the pre-colonial days, those were not necessarily um, terms that were used to separate people. It referred more to what their occupation was. So the Tutsis tended to be more cattle owners um, uh, and Hutus tended to be more farmers. And so they mixed and mingled quite readily. Um, they shared a common language and a common culture. Intermarriage was not unheard of. Um, the king, uh, you wanna say that one out loud, Dorian? Gravity. Gravity, yeah. um, he also um, 
he was a little more aggressive with his neighbors and um, trying to take over some of his neighbors' territories. So again, even, even the, the reign of this great monarch was not necessarily about Hutu versus Tutsi or vice versa. It was about how to get more power for um, his reign. When the colonizers come, unfortunately, the colonizers do what colonizers did everywhere. They didn't necessarily care about the people they colonized, but what those people could give them. And the Germans were the first to assert colonial rule um, at the turn of the century. They didn't make a great deal of changes in Rwanda, um, but they did, you know, charge some taxes. They really wanted them to export more coffee in particular. But when the Belgians came in after 1916, after World War I, um, they began to um, create more of those exclusionary uh, practices between the two major ethnic groups at the time and, and today as well. Um, they, um, they, they, the changes they, they imposed on Rwanda were reflected in the changes that were happening in Belgium. Um, so the, um, you know, the, the shifting of support between the Tutsis and the Hutus depended on what was happening and what would benefit Belgium back home. The, it was actually the Belgians who created the, the real sharp divisions between the Tutsis and the Hutus. The Tutsis, according to the Belgians, were taller and um, the, the Belgian king said they were more honorable and eloquent personalities. Um, most importantly of that characteristic, the Tutsis at the time were more willing to convert to Roman Catholicism, which made them much more um, acceptable as rulers or people in power in Rwanda for the Belgians during their colonial period. The Hutus were farmers and while the Belgians ruled or, or while it was a Belgian colony, the Hutus were, were treated like peasants, um, almost in a feudalistic relationship. One of the most controversial things that the Belgians did was create this system of corvée, which forced the um, farmers to cultivate coffee in particular um, for export, export rather, uh, so that the Belgians could keep the profit of that. It was the Belgians that introduced the racial identification cards. Um, it was the Belgians who determined that the Tutsis were um, better capable of excelling in education. And so most of the people who were allowed to be educated or were encouraged to be educated were Tutsis. Um, so the, the imposition of ethnic differences came from the Belgians first and foremost. There's nothing in the history or archeological evidence or um, sociological history of the region that, that defends this idea of, um, you know, one ethnic group being superior to the other ethnic group. Um, it comes from Europe and it was the same basis of arguments um, that led to Hitler and, and um, folks of that nature. But colonial rule across the continent came to an end in the 50s and 60s. It was a, a concerted effort not necessarily together, but this idea that Africa should be for Africans, not for European overlords. And so um, a lot of different groups across the continent were beginning to organize and press for their own independence from their colonial overlords. And this fell on, on Rwanda as well. Um, but in that effort to get out from under the Belgian colonial power, um, they also began to fight each other for who should be the successor to the Belgian authorities. Um, the Hutu ethnic group is a majority by numbers in Rwanda and the Tutsis are a minority. Um, in the, the conflicts in the 50s and 60s, many of the Tutsis fled and into neighboring countries um, and, um, and then came back as colonialism ended. Um, in 1959, the Tutsi king was overthrown by the Hutus. Um, and then the Belgians decided, as other colonial powers were deciding, to wash their hands. And they held a referendum. And the people of Rwanda voted to have a parliamentary system not continue under the colonial power of the Belgians. It didn't necessarily end the, the civil strife, but um, eventually, um, juvenile 
Habyarimana, again, destroying the poor man's name in 1973 in a coup, essentially is able to take over and set up a single party state under himself um, for a couple of decades. Um, he is known for his, um, his discrimination against Tutsis and even his own Hutu people um, who he considered to be extremist. Um, and some of those groups gathered and, and um, organized outside of Rwanda and in the northern part of Rwanda, um, in Uganda, for example, um, the rebels for um, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, rather, um, invaded, came down from the north and from Uganda and elsewhere and began a, a real serious civil war in 1990, um, which led to um, the, um, I skipped something in the middle here. Oh, um, but, but 1990, yeah, sorry. But in 1994, okay, my mouse is stuck, sorry. We're just going all over the place. Uh, but in 1994, um, Javier Rimana's jet was shot down. Um, he wasn't the only dignitary on that jet, uh, but, but the, the story was let out that he was shot down by the Tutsis, and so by the Tutsi rebels. And so, um, the um, radio stations, the, the others, um, it was a state-sponsored, state-orchestrated genocide that killed 800 to 900,000 people in a matter of weeks. Um, nearly three quarters of the Tutsi population living in Rwanda was wiped out, along with a lot of um, Hutus who protected Tutsis or, or tried to um, stand up to the rebels. Um, on the radio, they would use the terms like cockroaches, like the Tutsis were cockroaches coming out of the woods to take over. Um, the Rwanda Patriotic Front from Uganda and Northern Rwanda, one of the people who led that um, is, is Paul Kagame. He was very much a part of that movement. Um, and the RPF was successful in defeating the National Army and the Hutu militias who were you know, randomly killing people with machetes. And by the end of the year, they were able to have the first um, government, the, the government of national unity was in place. Um, the first open elections, the first free elections were held in 1999. And in between that period, Paul Kagame was the de facto president, technically vice president, who was elected in his own right in 2003, re-elected in 2010, and then moved to change the constitution and was reelected again in 2017. So many of us here know the story of Paul Rusesa Bagina, who was the um, general manager, well, he was assistant general manager, and then during the genocide, um, contacted the, the Swiss owners of the hotel and was elevated to general manager so that he could make decisions at the hotel. And so we know him from the Hotel Rwanda movie or um, other stories about his life. He fell out of favor with Paul Kagame because he criticized Paul Kagame, especially after uh, Kagame changed the constitution and was reelected again um, in 2017. So last month, while he was visiting friends in UAE, remember where um, Rwanda deals, its first trading partner is the UAE, United Arab Emirates. Um, he was, he disappeared <laughs> and showed up in, in Kigali and he faced a trial for um, sponsoring um, terrorist activities and he was last week, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago or so, um, he was found guilty of, of the terrorist activity and sentenced to 25 years in prison. And so um, our students here at Bradley, first, um, take a moment to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about yourselves. And I, I'd like to just point out to everybody that these guys are young. <laughs> so they were born well after this, this genocide that we all know in the West, but it may or may not have a, a bearing on them. So Dorian? Do you want to start? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, hi. Um, like you said, I am pretty young. 
I was born in 2000, so that was like six years after the war. Um, yeah, I was born and raised in Rwanda. Um, grew up in, in a world that was much more safer and stable compared to what my parents grew up in. Um, I would say I lived a privileged life from my point of view. Um, I, most of, uh, I went to school back home. Um, I moved to the U U.S. when I started college. Um, yeah, so currently at Bradley, I'm a senior um, majoring in industrial engineering. Um, I don't know what else you guys would like to know about my background, but yeah, that's a bit of, about, about me. No, oh, that's good. Arno, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh oh, you're going to send somebody else. <laughs> All right, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, I'm Arno Dushime, and uh, I'm currently a junior here at Bradley. And same as Lorraine, I was born in 2000. And uh, uh, I'd say, yeah, my life was also really different from what uh, my parents and my other siblings lived through. And um, let's see, I moved to the U.S. my sophomore year of high school. And then that's how I got to Bradley after that. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> so do people in Rwanda who live in Rwanda now, like your parents, for example, do they ever talk about this era, the, the 94 genocide? So um, you can go first. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Uh, so for like my parents, they, they don't, it's not like an everyday talk, but they only talk about it usually like maybe you know, like the memorial week where they like they have like a week off to like remember and then just they, they usually like have shows on like tv and then or like presentations or yeah they just have guest speakers and they just talk about uh like the genocide of what they learn and what they can improve but other than that we don't really talk about the genocide that much okay yeah um i would say so it is after all, um, a sensitive topic. Um, and like I know said, during uh, the Memorial Month, that's when usually there was more conversations on TV, on radio, um, um, people shared their stories. But in terms of like day to day, um, maybe within families, um, obviously parents will share stories, uh, uncles and aunts will uh, share their stories within the families. But outside of that, uh, it's a topic that's not uh, talked about much and kind of to point out what uh, Angela said earlier uh, saying there's three ethnic ethnic groups in the country um, just like that's been like an abolished it's been abolished technically so it's not something that people still go around saying like oh uh, they're part of uh, this ethnic group this one is part of this ethnic group so uh, it's not really talked about much and obviously people will have an idea and know about it and talk Maybe it's something you can talk about then with your family, but not uh, on the outside. So, yeah. So, uh, a sense that people in Rwanda are Rwandan. They're, they're yeah. not, you know, Hutu and Tutsi anymore. You're Rwandan. Yeah. yeah. Yes. You know, that's an important step to, to healing. Um, um, have you ever heard of the term, uh, and I'm, I'm going to, I should have written it down. Is it the kakaka system, the sitting under the trees, the justice on the lawn or the justice on the grass? Um, that uh -huh. was, have you heard of that system? Do you mean like the reconciliation? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, um, I think it's pronounced kachakara or something. Um, so from my basic understanding, when the war ended, um, obviously you're trying uh, to get things back to normal. It's not something that can just happen. Obviously, the ones that have lost people will, would want to get their revenge well, if their party is the one in control now. Um, but the ones who took leadership at that time, um, they encourage more forgiveness. And the, the program you mentioned was a part of um, getting communities together uh, and getting people who did terrible crimes to admit their crimes and getting families that were um, harmed um, to 
kind of sit and listen and also forgive. And yeah, that's basically the essence of it. You know, I, I talk about this in one of my classes because <clears throat> think about it, you know, during this difficult period, this horrible period, a lot of people were involved. So yeah. either as ones who were harming their, their neighbors or ones who are running from the ones who want to do them harm. And yeah. you can't put everybody in prison. I mean, your whole country would be in prison or, or fleeing, right? Yeah. Um, and so the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the, the you know, justice on the grass, as it was commonly called, um, has actually been used a number of times since Rwanda. It's been a, a, a model for the way to get people to, like you said, talk about what happened, bring it out in the open, and figure out a way to either at least forgive or let it go and move on. Yeah. You know, that's an impressive system. So, um, Wait, could you just tell us some countries they've used that? I wasn't aware that it's been used in South other. Africa has used it. Um, they've tried to implement something like it in Bosnia. Okay. Um, you know, former Yugoslavia. So, okay. Yeah. So, um, not anybody has done it as well as Rwanda did it, I have to tell you. But <laughs> hopefully, we don't have a whole lot of places that have to use it um, yeah. again in the future. So, you know, <laughs> let's not test it out. Um, what do you guys think about your president, Paul Kagame? And he's been there a long time. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, do you want to go first or should I? You can go first. Um, personally, I think um, he's a really good leader. Um, like you said, Rwanda is a pretty small country. We don't have that many minerals. We're landlocked, um, but we're within uh, one of the fastest growing countries in the world. Um, we're one of the uh, better countries on the continent, whether in terms of safety or economics. Um, he's been a big part in ending the war in the country. Um, and the, the funny thing about our president is it's usually people who are from Rwanda that, that, that have a problem with him. And the, for the most part, I think uh, most of the country um, like him as a president and want him to keep leading. Um, and usually during the elections, he has over 90 something percent of the votes. Wow. Uh, obviously a lot of Western countries will claim that there's something wrong in the elections. Um, he's obviously a leader that doesn't bow down to any of the Western powers. He's all about um, Africans being sustainable themselves. Um, he goes against a lot of some of the Western countries, but personally for me, I, I like to have him as a president. And another thing about the presentation he had said, I noted that saying that he changed the constitution. Um, I think that him running, being able to run again, um, if I remember correctly, he had stated that he wanted to uh, stop being president, but for the most part, a lot of the population wanted him to keep running. So. Uh, they set up votes where people chose whether they'd want the parliament to vote on whether he can run again or not. So it was more people demanding it than um, obviously him too, he ran again, but it, I think it was more the people. So that's a pretty long answer. But, um, no, that's a really good, that, thank you. That's a really good point to make because he didn't do it in violation of the people's will. He did it, yeah. he ran again because he was asked to run again. That's yeah. a that's important. What do you think, Arno? Yeah, so uh, similarly with Dorian, I also like uh, President Pokagame. Uh, like just comparing him to like other leaders in Africa or around the world, like what has done is pretty significant and you can just like ignore it. Uh, so like just according, just seeing what he has done shows that he is a good leader and he knows what he's doing and he knows how to lead people. So I I support him all the way. <laughs> yeah. Emmanuel's got his hand up. Do you want to ask a question? No, I just wanted to contribute. Oh, go ahead. That's okay. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say that I I agree. Um, even though I'm not Rwandan, I'm Ghanaian. Um, I do agree because sometimes countries in Africa we are not most of them or some of them are not used to you know democracy you know and so the constant changing governments kind of make our governments and our progress kind of unstable so if sometimes we do get a leader who is really committed to developing the country for a long time um that is usually a good thing the only bad thing about it is you know you don't really know if that leader is going to be committed to developing or going to be you know power conscious and you know just do what benefits him or her only but i think in rwanda's case it has been a good gamble and um you know the president has been committed to making rwanda a better place so that's one of the things that i wanted to say that usually the west kind of demonizes countries that do not necessarily follow democracy which isn't always a bad thing you know sometimes a country just needs some time to develop before it gets on, on the democratic track and, and that's a really good point. Um, we forget that in our early days, we had a lot of instability <laughs> in the early days of the United States because none of us were around then. <laughs> but but uh, for those of us who've studied US history, you're right. I mean, we, we also could have used a little more stability um, while we got our feet under ourselves. So um, the, um, I think, I think from a Western perspective, and anybody else on here um, can jump in and talk as well, but I think from a Western perspective, most of us also appreciated your president because he is taking a country that had a really horrible incident and um, really putting it on a path to development right up until he arrested Paul Rusesa Begina under questionable circumstances and now has sentenced him to 25 years. Well, and again, your president didn't, your court did. Um, but there are many who pay attention to that and, and criticize the court in general that, you know, this guy was never going to get a fair trial. He should never have been brought back to Rwanda. He didn't go to Rwanda. They, they essentially speared him away um, from a third country. He was a um, Belgian and I think U.S. actually citizen and so that's why the U.S. government is paying attention. Um, so you know is that just a blip on your president or, or should there be any concerns that he might be turning toward authoritarianism? Um, I think there's a lot to the question, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of points to expand on. Um, I guess starting off with how he was arrested, um, from my understanding, he wasn't kidnapped. It was more, he was tricked into going into the country where he can be arrested, um, which obviously the, um, whether that's right or wrong can be debated. Uh, but in terms of Paul, I think Paul, he's, he's more known in the U.S. for his book and the movie they made about him. But to most Rwandans and from what I've heard from people who were there, he's not the hero he was he portrayed himself to be in the book. Um, and that that aside, um, obviously he gained popularity in the US and when the movie came out and he wanted in the long term to move back and be president, I think. Um, but he didn't, I don't think he had that many supporters in the country um, to begin with. And then, what was the point? I forgot the point I was going to make. Um, and one of the reasons they, they arrested him was um, he he was supporting terrorist activity um, from neighboring countries, wanting to, um, they, the terrorist groups were located in a neighboring country with Rwanda, and he was uh, funding those groups and um, supporting um, violence and that's why I guess the country wanted to arrest him and charge him and that's why he was charged against um, and to be honest for me I don't feel um, what our country did in arresting him and charging him is any wrong I think um, if any country uh, especially western countries will go above and beyond for national security whether it's going to other countries to arrest people who are um, 
causing concern for their own national security. So for me, I think it, it was, it was um, what happened was, um, wasn't wrong, I guess. But that's from also a basic understanding of the circumstances. There's obviously a lot to um, touch upon, but from my basic understanding, that's, that, that's where I stand. I can, I can throw in my two cents that yeah. the United States have done similar things <laughs> in the name Wait, of security. <laughs> so, you know, so for us to point fingers and say that Rwanda should not do it um, is a little disingenuous. You're right. I mean, countries have to protect themselves. And in this case, they feel that he is a danger. So yeah. to, to their country. And so um, do, do, you, did you, do you disagree, Arno? Are you okay with that response? Um, honestly, I don't, I didn't know who that person is. I didn't watch the movie. I didn't, I don't know who he is at all. Like, I don't follow any of the politics. <laughs> okay, no, that's okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I didn't know what was going on. When you told me that's when I looked into it, but I had no idea what was going on. Okay. Yeah. You guys are young, you know, I mean, yeah. this, is, this is before your time. <laughs> and, and he left the country. So even, you know, if he just stayed in the country, maybe you would have known more about him because he probably, like Dorian pointed out, probably might have gotten involved more in politics, but he left. And so, you know, <laughs> so it's kind of um, a side note for you guys because you're so young. Yeah. So, Fun, funny story. I, I think I first heard about the movie when I came here. Um, we had this class where it was a communications class where you were paired with a student and the student had to do a presentation on you. So <laughs> let's say if I'm paired with you, Angela, I'll have to do a presentation about your life. And the kid who did a presentation on me had a video from Hotel Rwanda. I mean, it was just funny because I think the movie was banned in our country or something. Oh, um, oh wow. It's not uh, a movie that a lot of people are supportive of. So, but yeah, that was a fun oh. story. <laughs> So instead of, you know, our view of your, of you and your country, how would you characterize Rwanda? What's, what's the best parts about your country? What do you love the most about it? And then be fair, what do you think are its biggest challenges? No, no, you want to go first? Uh, sure. So, uh, what was the question again? <laughs> Sorry. What do you think are the best parts of Rwanda? What are its strengths? So for his strengths, uh, I'd say we have a huge like young population. So like that's a like a future workforce that the country needs and they could use. And it's also like it's not developed, so there's room for improvement for almost most of the aspects in the country. And so yeah, I think it's like a good way to get involved. Like if you want to start something, there's not as much competition as anywhere, at, like for example, the U.S. So if you want, uh, if you're ready to start something, you you can have like a better chance of, uh, uh, I guess, like of being right or of profiting. And I also like the people. It's, it's we're all like we're all united now, so we don't talk about who to see or you know the like the group. So. We are, we're all really united and friendly and loving, and it's just a good community to be around. Terrific. What do you think, yeah. Dorian? Um, yeah, I'll definitely second what Arnold said. Um, the people, starting off the people, pretty friendly. If you want to visit, um, I think you'll be welcomed. And we all, I think most of the country, we're becoming more and more of an English country, so I don't think you don't have that much of trouble communicating with people there. Um, so yeah, the people, the stability in the country, the safety, um, it's an overall, um, at least in the city, to, even in the um, rural areas, I don't think is that dangerous or anything. Um, and in terms of economics, it's a fast growing country, a lot of business coming there, um, a lot of Western investors coming. So there's a lot of opportunity, especially for us young people and a lot of room for growth. Um, also the tourism for you, not personally for me, but I know for um, um, people from outside the country, they like whether it's our parks or the gorillas, 
Um, so yeah, there's a lot to like the climate too, where, where land, everywhere it hills and the views are be just beautiful. So I'd say, yeah, that's the best part about the country. And in terms of uh, play, a room for growth, I guess, uh, we're still a fairly poor country. Um, there's a lot of um, things the country still needs to grow on. And I think me and now knowing people our age, um, that's up to us to continue to build upon um, the country that our parents have built. And the beautiful part about Rwanda too, it's a small place. Everyone knows everyone. I didn't, I didn't, we weren't, me and I know when specifically friends, but we knew of each other and we know <laughs> each other's friends. So uh, it's good to have a tight knit con a country that feels tight knit. Um, and yeah, we're, I, I feel like most runners still are, are serious about wanting to uh, build, build up their country, especially uh, coming, having the history that the country has. There's a level of passion that we have that. Obviously, there's other countries too where there's that level of oppression, but I think for me, at least, I've noticed it, whether it's from young people and uh, people who are my parents' age. So, yeah. I think uh, Rwanda is um, considered the second most stable economy in, in Sub Saharan Africa and second only to Botswana. So, yeah. um, I think Volkswagen just opened a big production facility in, in Kigali. And uh, um, I can't remember which of the, you know, the football leagues has a, has a big team base there and uh, basketball is getting quite big. And um, so, you know, they have a, a team that plays, you know, in the circuit. And again, it's a relatively small territory wise country, but it has a huge footprint in, in its um, outreach. So, yeah. so um, what do you guys think? Are you are you planning to go back to be part of the next level of development or not yet? <laughs> I mean, when you graduate, are you gonna go back and work in Rwanda or are you gonna work somewhere else? Wait, my thing cut off for a second. Was your question the plans oh, left? Sorry. What are your future plans after you graduate from Bradley? Are you going to go back to Rwanda? Or are you going to take a detour first and go somewhere else first? Um, personally, like you said, <laughs> we're young. So I think for me, um, at least my 20s, um, I think I want to, I'm open to exploring the world. I, I actually, that's the optimal. I'd love to live in multiple places and also just gaining the skills. Um, just building myself up in terms of what I bring to the table, the skills I gain. And I feel like that's best. My best option in doing that is uh, in the US or Europe or Canada. Um, so I probably see myself staying in the US or uh, somewhere in the Western country for my 20s. Well, if I eventually mid 30s or early 30s, I, I want to move back. And yeah. Okay. Yeah, so same as him, uh, I'd probably I also want to gain some experience before I, I go back, but eventually I will go back, and yeah, and I also want to go back, like, just visit regularly, like, at least once a year, and just to stay connected to the to the country, but eventually I, I will go back. I'm telling you guys, organize a trip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put Emmanuel on the spot as well. How about you, Emmanuel? Are you going to go back to Ghana in the near future? Or are you going to travel a bit, see the world first? Uh, I actually do want to go to Ghana after I'm done with law school. Um, but I, I have to be here a little bit to get the, um, the experience um, because I, I think you know, practically young people are given more experience regarding what they want to do. And, you know, I offered more opportunities here, um, at least at this moment in time than um, in many parts of um, Africa. So if we really want to make an impact, you know, we must have the experience, which I think we will get here. Um, if we go in experience, it is very improbable that we will be allowed to make any difference that we want to we want to impact. Okay. 
All right, so now I get to ask the mom question. <laughs> Since you guys are going to travel for a few years first, um, do you get pressure from your families to settle down, find a, find a wife, and start having some grandkids for me? Not for me personally, but you know, for your parents. <laughs> uh for for now like at my age they don't they don't care about that yet okay. but for my sister like i guess like once you start getting like close to your 30s they start asking but i guess for now also, like since we're still in college i don't really ask about that okay <laughs> yeah and the same, and the same um i usually go visit usually in the summer or like at least once a year so and my siblings too whenever they get the chance to go back and visit but in terms of settling down, I think, so yeah, kind of like what I said, when you're approaching your 30s, that's when you start getting the pressure and pressure from African parents as well. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it was actually a culture shock. I was best man for one of my friends in college. He was getting married at 21. Like, that's not something that happens back home. It's more people get married uh, closer to their 30s. Okay. Is that the same in Ghana? Yeah, um, it's the same in Ghana. Usually people get married around 28, you know, 20, especially the men. There isn't a lot of um, pressure to get married uh, in your in your um, 20s. And especially if you've, you've traveled, you know, the, I mean, the pressure is that you, you kind of succeed, you know, because, you know, usually there's a lot of investment in you if you have traveled. So marriage is usually not the, the goal of the family, at least um, in your 20s. Gainful employment, right? <laughs> Take care of the family so uh, so grandma and grandpa can retire or mom and dad can retire. <laughs> so, um, is it the same for women? Do women also wait until they're about 30? I know you said your, your sister is kind of getting the pressure to settle down. No, my older sister already got married. She's oh. like, she's 29, I think. Okay. Yeah, so she got married. Uh, but she's, yeah, she got married a year ago. Okay. So That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah, she doesn't have to get married right out of college either. Yeah. So okay. Um, yeah. Right. That's interesting. That's good. So um, um, sorry, <laughs> reading my questions, but I'm stuck on coffee. <laughs> so I was actually, you know, I love Rwandan coffee, and I was surprised that it was a forced labor thing brought on by the the Belgians. Um, because it's such a huge um, export today, um, coffee from Rwanda. Is there any resentment of the coffee growers of that, of that old history, dredging up the old history from the Belgian colonizers? Do you know? Is there, or, you know, is it just a, a solid export item? I'd say I, I doubted there was any resentment. Because uh, to be honest with you, I, I didn't know that fact. Um, it's not. I mean, yeah, I didn't know it either until I was doing the research. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it might have started off bad, but I guess now it's it's a big um, export for the country and brings in a lot of income. So I don't know if there's that much resentment. Okay. Um, maybe for the colonialism and all the other negative things, but I guess coffee was was a negative after all. Yeah, I, I didn't know it was brought by colonialism either. So, I, I yeah, I don't think there's any resentment from it because I think now they they see the value from the coffee and more now more people are try, starting to grow more coffee actually. So, right. yeah, I don't think there's any resentment now. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions? Because I think uh, I think you guys have, are are really good representatives of your countries. So, and, and thanks for jumping in, Emmanuel. So not Rwanda, but still, <laughs> and, and not technically close either. Ghana, how far is Ghana from Rwanda? How many countries apart? Five? It's really far, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's kind of far. Yeah. Uh, actually, I think I have, I, if I go back to my um, slideshow, maybe I have the whole continent in there somewhere. Let me see. I'm not sure if it has, um, so, so, you know, you've got Rwanda here, 
I have my wrong glasses on, I'm sorry. Um, why can't I find Ghana? Uh, Ghana is the green, the Accra. Am I going the wrong way? It's no, green. go up. Oh, you moved, no, come Fine. down a little bit. A little bit down. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah right here. there. Okay, that's why, because Ghana is really small. <laughs> Yeah, it yeah, is. You're right. The capitals in capital in uh, bold, mm -hmm. but I'm like, so where's the name of the country? I thought it was over here. But yeah, so from Ghana to Rwanda is pretty far away. <laughs> um, it's important for us to remember that Africa is a continent, <laughs> not a country, and that there are lots of countries <laughs> in Africa. So we, uh, um, you know, we in the United States tend to lump you all in together like it's like it's one place you know <laughs> i think europe's starting to fall into the same category for us in america europe is like one country <laughs> so we don't understand when they have disputes among them it's like why <laughs> so sorry I, i'm poking fun of our own country uh, us poor americans <laughs> who don't know a great deal about the world <laughs> unless you're in the world affairs council right that's why you're here so Anybody got a question? Otherwise we can let them get back to studying. This was really fun. Thank you. And, and I'm very, very serious about organizing a trip to Rwanda. We'll stay with your parents, Doreen. No, <laughs> just kidding. You're actually <laughs> welcome. I feel like the Rwandans are very welcoming. <laughs> My parents would be happy to do that. Oh, that'd be excellent. You know, the, the fellow whose coffee I, I really like um, <laughs> has, um, has said that we should get there you know I mean, we should come and stay with him and his family and i don't remember he lives up in the hills somewhere and he has this just gorgeous pictures of his region and um he said well, you know you might have to walk a ways to get here <laughs> like i'm not sure i can do that but you know <laughs> um somebody did ask one last question here about um what do you see as the biggest challenge for the future of rwanda Yeah. yeah, that's a really good question. For me, at least, um, from what I've observed, one of the reasons why Rwanda is where it's at right now is just um, the incredible strength of the people are leading now. So people who are my parents' age and older. Um, so people who have gone through war and a genocide, they have a certain level of strength and dedication to building the country. Whereas for me and kids my age, we kind of grew up in a privileged world. And I don't think I see the hunger and the passion as much in the younger generation as uh, there is in the older. And it's something that our parents do and keep pointing to us that uh, eventually it will be our country to lead and uh, we have to keep building on to what um, our the previous generation built upon. So I think that's a challenge um, from an introspective <laughs> thing I've had with some of my friends and just seeing, uh, recognizing the privilege we grew up around them. So yeah, I think that's a pretty, and another challenge too, is just continue to grow economically. Um, there's still people leaving and quite a bit of poverty, so yeah. Yeah, I also think the economic like the economy is going to be one of our biggest challenges especially because we are like a small country we're landlocked it's hard to do business in the country but i mean it's actually easy not, not hard like it that way but it's just uh there's not it's not as accessible to other countries uh, so it's i guess it's more challenging but um another challenge i think is just it like the education of younger people uh if we're able to like like actually engage and like get the younger generation educated i think that'd be a great way to like change the country and boost it to uh, a different level okay yeah did you want to jump in emmanuel yes i did um I was gonna say that I think one of the, I've been paying attention to Rwanda for a while and generally um, Africa as a whole. Um, one of the issues that 
is facing Rwanda and other African countries is um, the economy, as they said, but industrialization as a whole, you know, because if you, if you don't have your country's resources, if you don't, if you haven't industrialized, you're exporting your, your, your materials in the raw form, you know, it's not processed. Right. And then you're selling it as a cheaper, um, at, at a cheaper price. Um, case in point, um, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire actually are the biggest exporter of cocoa in the world. And the cocoa industry is like a hundred billion dollars worth in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire have retained only about 1.2 billion together, you know? So yeah, so they are not able to industrialize. So they are selling their their raw materials in their, like in a raw form. And, you know, that's, that doesn't help, you know? And Rwanda being a small country too, you know, when it goes against the biggest economies like the US, you know, trying to bargain, it does, it's usually not in their favor. So one of the, you know, I think that's one of the issues facing Rwanda and Africa as a whole, finding a way in the revenue to kind of industrialize and to, you know, make their own um, processed materials is kind of the biggest challenge right now. Okay, yeah, that's a really good point. It kind of, perpetuates the, the dependency theory that was created under the colonial era. And it's gonna be hard to break. So, how about um, infrastructure in Rwanda? Do you have decent roads, bridges, airports? Yes, there is pretty good like road, like the roads are, are Improving, I'd say there's always they're always building and and, and like uh, adding more roads, and and I think they have like uh, an agreement with like China to just help like the to fasten the process, and they're also building I think a second international airport at the moment, and I think it's almost done. So, yeah, and there's a lot of infrastructure going on. Like every time I go home, like I I get lost. I don't know what building is where because it's it's just grows really fast. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah, I think in the infrastructure uh, part, I think Rwanda is doing pretty well, at least in the city. Um, the, the roads are well built and yeah, the government continue to put in a lot of effort and capital into uh, <clears throat> improving the infrastructure because it's a big part of uh, development. And it's fun to see too, from when I was a kid to now, uh, just the drastic difference in like whether it's the roads or the internet, whatever is just um, the big difference, and it's good to see that much drastic change as we grow. And yeah, I'm excited to see where we go next. I think um, one of the statistics I found when I was looking at Rwanda: seven out of ten people, <laughs> not like you know, seven out of 10 adults, <laughs> but seven out of 10, actually, I think it's like 7.7 .7 out of 10 people um, has a mobile phone in Rwanda. So mm -hmm. that's like every adult and most of the children too. <laughs> so, um, so you're very much connected to the world, to the internet, you know, to, to, for communications for certain. Um, and that, that's a positive thing. So... <laughs> I remember when I first landed in the U.S., <clears throat> actually in Peoria, my brother came to pick me up, and I saw potholes on the road, and I was like, oh, y'all have this in America, and he was like, America is not what you see on TV, so <laughs> that was... Oh, I, I can definitely agree. My first time in, in America, I was like, what? Like, you know, because the media has, you know, America is all this. And when you see it in person, it's pretty great. But, you know, you kind of get a little bit disappointed when you come because you don't expect to see certain things. Yeah, because Hollywood is New York and Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah, it's very different. You gotta love the Midwest though, because we're friendly as all get out. So <laughs> you can go to New York and nobody'll talk to you. <laughs> we're gonna talk about the hotel. I just oh. saw a note. <laughs> so I think um I think we'll let you guys get back to studying because I know you got homework. Sure. And yeah. This is really nice. I really appreciate you guys is you guys talking about Rwanda and, and sharing your views of the future and uh 
good luck here at Bradley. And Emmanuel, if, for those of you guys in the World Affairs Council, Council Emmanuel is one of the interns <laughs> that we um, have benefited from his insights and um, expertise. So um, welcome, Emmanuel. <laughs> thank you for jumping in tonight. And thank you, Dorian. And I know this was really, really a nice, pleasant conversation about Rwanda. <laughs>